I'm Etch. Um, I'm going to be going through a track I made recently for RenderMag. Um, I'm just going to break down the processes I used uh, and the way it came together and sort of the influences behind it. Um, it's a really simple track. Um, when I was asked to do this, I thought, you know, oh, I should, you know, I should probably floss and, uh, you know, show my sort of most complicated track and the track where I made use of some of the equipment I have. Um, but I thought about, you know, when I was sort of learning to produce, teaching myself by looking at guides online and, you know, reading forums and magazines. Um, I always found it quite difficult at the start because people would tend to overcomplicate things and, you know, sort of be a bit elitist and be like, oh, you know, you can't do that on such and such. You need to do it this way and you need to buy this and buy that. Um, so, you know, as a sort of way of, away from that, I did sort of completely the opposite. And I just tried to do everything I could within the software I had, which has always been Fruity Loops. Um, I've tried to use, I mean, I have used a number of programs over the like 13, 14 years I've been me messing about with, with software. Um, I've used Logic, I've used Cubase, I've used Pro Tools, Ableton, um, Reaper as well is quite a good one. Um, and yeah, I just felt that a lot of them sort of fell on their face a bit with uh, accessibility. Um, what I really like about Fruity Loops is just everything is just there. Um, it's, you know, it's not hidden away in menus and sub menus and whatever. It's just there in like the quickest way to get your brain to the computer. And that's how it should be. Um, but yeah, so this track, uh, I made it on a pretty bad day, as I'm sure you're going to hear. Um, <laughs> Bad in, as in, you know, I wasn't feeling myself. Uh, but yeah, I'll just play the, a, a bit of it. <laughs> I like to dissect girls. Did you know I'm utterly insane? Uh, <laughs> uh. Yeah, I was just, I think with music, a lot of the time, there's sort of two kinds of tracks that I make. There are the ones that I spend loads of time on and spend, you know, hours and hours and days and days worrying about each individual sound, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, and there are the tracks that are just, you know, it's almost hard to explain. Um, just a, a direct emotional reaction um, and they don't come around that often uh, you know that feeling where it's like the track has made itself um, but it's good that you know I've got one saved that I can show people um, because I think as it, people are probably going to see <laughs> with the the processes behind this I wasn't doing a lot of, you know, complicated thinking. I was just trying to make something simple that hits hard. Um, so, I mean, I'll, st I'll do it track by track. Uh, so the great thing about Fruity Loops is um, you can, you, you basically work on 
patterns rather than tracks themselves, which is the common place in most DAWs. Um, in the sense that you know each each track will represent this track on the mixer, and that's not the case in Fruity Loops. Um, the way you sort of work with the mixer is you link each individual sound to a separate track rather than you know having all the drums on one channel having all the bass on one channel etc um so what this does it, it it lets you get deeper into each sound um so just the drums themselves So, I mean, I could go on for days about, about drum programming. Um, obviously, these are in triplets, um, which is, you know, sort of a reference to trap and UK drill. Um, and and also, not, yeah, I, I think a lot of people, when they talk about, you know, the triplet hi-hat roll and all of that stuff, they kind of look down on it a little bit because it seems like an easy way to complicate a rhythm. Um, but I mean, you listen to, to a lot of like older hip hop and stuff like that. And the way the beats are a little, can be a little bit awkward and sound a little bit off beat. I think like working in triplets with the beats really lends itself to that. And it's like, I mean, this beat itself, it sounds, like a bit awkward and a bit sort of lumbering and clumbersome um and i really like that uh and the way i do my drums when i'm not like i, I um i'm known for using breaks quite a lot but uh with drums themselves when i'm using individual hits uh i'm not sure what samples i used here um some drum pack on the internet just yeah just kicks and snares um so the way i link my drums up is you can do what's it, it's a layer so you go add miscellaneous layer and what that allows you to do is so you've got it there um so say i want these all linked so you select them like that just by holding down click and dragging and you would go set children and then you go on layering and you would go split children which is there i'm not going to do it because it will mess everything up because it will in, instead of the midi information that is being sent from the sample into the track and the mixer it will just link it to this and it would mean i'd have to rearrange everything in the mixer but that's how i did it um, I mean these these hits here they're just link they're not linked to anything they're just separate because you can see I've just used them on the step sequencer as opposed to using them in a layer um, I'm not quite sure why I did that I think what I would have done is I would have made this beat and probably when it came down to mixing I, I realized that I needed another a kick and another snare rule I've used claps here yeah so I would have I would have added those at the end for mixing purposes just to fill it up fill the frequencies up because I wanted the beat to hit really hard um but yeah so it's these sounds that are linked uh these hits here so when I go onto this now, which is now its own layer, all of the all of the hits are on individual keys on the piano roll. Um, I haven't actually got my uh, MIDI controller turned on, but you know you can play them out on a MIDI controller. Um, 
so yeah this i mean this is what i ended up with and as you can see it's just like two kicks on top of each other and so i think that's a i think that's a 909 hat there just a sort of little perk and that's so that's actually from uh a future music drum break um i think you if anybody listens to uk hardcore that's fairly familiar so that adds to sort of the wonkiness of the beat as well because that's actually a kick and a snare in one so that's why i've put it in a bit of a weird place that you know that's probably not where it should be if you're thinking literally you know um and then just that that's just like a quiet sort of side stick snare that i've just added over the top to sort of give a little flicker um and then just a reversed hat with a little bit of a kick in it so again it's the samples themselves are a bit messy and lend themselves to the sort of messy sound of of the whole beat um and yeah obviously i've got these in just to anchor it down so on the mixer um so we've got the kick So where the bass line is a really big thing on this track, I wanted to make sure that the beat didn't really interfere with it. And I could have done that, well, I have sort of done it like this as well, uh, with side chaining, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, but aside aside from the side chaining, uh, I wanted, it, I wanted the, the kicks to sort of hit that, like, point, you know, that, like, punch. So what I've done is I've completely cut the frequencies below 100 hertz. Um, and I've sort of pushed the low mid, but also cut off the high. So it sort of sits in that punchy region, um, which to be honest, I, I tend to avoid with kicks because I usually want the kicks to have a maximum amount of bass as well and I want them to sort of blend into the bass line in a way but for this I just wanted it, each part to stand out and stand on its own um, so yeah and obviously as far as EQing goes I am not the best in the world I mean what is EQing at the end of the day it's just making sound sit in a certain place on the spectrum and the way you do that is up to you but the way i do it is you know i push things really hard where realistically i should just be subtracting things and um you know pushing things with compressors instead of the actual frequencies but you know whatever you do to get to the sound you want it, you know there's no rules there aren't there literally aren't i can't remember how many times i've heard a tune and then sort of thought about how that was made and then sometimes found out about how it was made and being like all oh, right I'm just gonna tear up the rule book and throw it away again so there are no rules do whatever you want um but this is how i do things i, I push stuff and then i deal with the consequences um later so yeah that's just eqing that main kick and I've got an effect on it. Again, this is something that I don't usually do because it makes tends to make mixing a bit complicated. But where I've focused on the mid range of this kick, it kind of lends itself to this. So I've put a reverb on it. I've used Ice Verb, which is part of Guitar Rig, um, which is uh, a really great plugin. I use it on everything. It's just got so many different components you know it's got different reverbs you can you know it's got pitch modulation um, filters eq distortion you name it it's all in there and they're all really great uh 
but yeah, like Ice Verb particularly is, is a really cool one. So I'll just solo the kick. And if I turn Ice Verb off, So it's 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 really cool. It 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 has a a sort of resonant harmonic effect, um, almost like a spring reverb, but it's a little bit different. It's got its own sound, and obviously it's called ice verb. It, you know, it's, I guess it's kind of icy. Um, but yeah, that's a really great reverb, and you know, if we so that's that kick. So here I've got a bassier kick. So I would have EQ'd that, yeah. <laughs> I think, again, my really pushy EQing. Um, I've pushed it really hard at 40, 43 hertz. Um, yeah, so that's pretty, that's how a lot of my kicks, my kick drums look when I'm producing. Sort of, yeah, I sort of push it around 43 to 50, so, sorry, 40 to 50 and roll off the rest because that's where, you know, the bass line is. Also, the bass line is around here as well. Um, I think human hearing, uh, the typical human can't audibly hear bass frequencies below 20 hertz or it, maybe it's 25. I can't quite remember. Um but below those frequencies, you're going into what's known as like infrasound. Uh, and the way that works, um, it has a more sort of physical effect on you rather than audible. And again, that doesn't even matter unless, you, you know, there's massive subwoofers and stuff. You wouldn't ever be aware of it. Um, so, yeah, that's the way the kick is cut there. And where this kick... Uh, is sort of like the bassy kick and it's you know driving the bass of this rhythm a lot this is the uh kick that i've used to sidechain against but i'll get a bit more into that after um so that's the 909 hat uh and it's got a bit of neo verb on it which again it's a uh, by Isotope, really great reverb plugin. Um, really simple to use, and it's really intuitive. There's lots of different features and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think I've I haven't really done a huge lot with it. I've just changed changed around these little these filters. Sorry, these uh, <laughs> these uh, knobs a bit. Uh, which is what I tend to do. Like if, if a plugin opens, I just mess with stuff until, you know, I've got it to how I want. Um, and, you know, a really great thing to do is to open presets and sort of reverse engineer them. If you like get a preset and you turn it back to basically nothing, but take note of every step, that's how you really get into sort of the nitty gritty of, of learning synthesis and stunt things like that. Um, I've been doing it a lot lately, lately with uh, FM8, which is an FM synthesis by native synthesizer by native instruments. Um, and that's really a lot of people are put off by it because it's quite complicated. But when you really get down to it, and really look at it step by step. Um, you know, it's it's not as confusing as people think it is, and it's really great. But I haven't used it in this tune, so I don't know why I'm talking about it. But just a bit of advice. Um, so yeah, it's got a nano verb on it. Uh, it's got a phaser on it. That's like a that's an old sort of techno trick, putting a phaser on the open hi-hats just to give it a bit of movement um and probably some really harsh EQing oh not so bad yeah I've just cut out all sort of the low mids and the the lows 
and cut off the very highs. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into every single hit because that will take ages. And all it is really is just EQing. Um, yeah, the few tracks that have the few sounds that have effects on them are just yeah. Um, so what I do, which is a really good feature of um, Fruity Loops 20, um, each of these tracks uh, is just representative of a sound. Like I said earlier, how Fruity Loops, um, you link sounds to the mixer rather than, you know, they're already being tracks that are going out to a mixer. So this ha obviously has its benefits because uh, you can go in individually on each sound. But for the purposes of mixing, um, it's great to have an auxiliary track. Uh, so on here, I have this, which is a really great plugin um, for mixing. It's it basically it emulates the uh, analog to digital converters that were in the uh, S nine fifty sampler. So like a classic sort of jungle sampler. Um, and it just adds a, it's almost like a bit reduction. Um, but it, yeah, it just, it's just, it's just a good, it's almost like a compressor as well in a way. And it just adds a bit of grit to the sound. Um, so I've got that on the drum send and I've got the supercharger, which is just a pretty simple compressor. Um, and obviously the purpose of compression is to basically create a ceiling that the sound can't go above and also to bring out some warmth in it. Um, well, that's not, not that, do, that doesn't work for all compressors, but supercharger, it lets you add a bit of character to the sound with its punch and dirt features. Um, so the way this works is if you can see along here, there's this little green thread and that's just linked to the other track. And the way you do that is, so I'll turn it off. So that's now not linked. So you can't hear those kicks anymore. So what you do, is while the kick is highlighted, you just go uh, right click or two finger click if you're on a Mac and route to this track only. And you see there, it's just linked it straight up. And again, and then on this, you just have it going out to the master, which is here. And it just gives you an extra level of control um, for years and years, and obviously until FL20 came out, uh, all of my individual sounds would be going to the master, which sort of leads to a complicated mix down because you don't have that extra level of control. Um, but now you can do this, you know, the possibilities are endless of what you can do. Um, you know, you can even link things to multiple different outputs and sends and auxiliaries um so it's like a, a classic mixing desk in a sense um and you can also side chain through uh these but that's not how i side chain um i'll get to the side chaining in a bit so that's the beat and this is the bass I'll just loop up a bit with the bass. Ah. All right, yep. Yeah. 
So you can see there that the faders are jumping up and down uh, on the bass and also the, the main sample that's going along with the track. So this is how I learned to sidechain in Fruity Loops. It's, um, I guess when I started learning this, it was years and years ago, it was a bit fiddly and a bit shit compared to sort of the classic way to sidechain in other DAWs, which I found at the time to be a lot better. Um, but I've come to be really comfortable with this way of sidechaining and I find it, you know, I prefer it actually to the other ways to sidechain of which there are a few, you know, you can get different plugins and there's actually an, a Fruity Loops sidechain plugin. And also you can do it on the mixer now as well, which helps. But yeah, I, I always use this for, this way now. Um, and the way it works is you select the sound that you want to sidechain. Sorry, the sound that you want to trigger the sidechain. So here it's the kick. So what you do is you select a Fruity Peak controller. Obviously, this is specific to Fruity Loops. Um, and what this does, once it's selected, you can right click or two finger click if you're on a Mac, link to controller, and you link it to here, you see the Fruity Peak controller, link it to the peak. And then on the input, you go inverted and accept. And what that does is it links it so when the db goes up here, the fader will jump out of the way so it's like going like that if you think um and what i really like about this way of controlling uh with side chaining is the fruity peak controller itself lets you get quite creative with it um so here you can see, uh, you know what, let's turn off these. So I've got the volume turned all pretty much all the way up. So that's the level you'll be hitting the side chain at. So if I put it on maximum, you can hear the cut really clearly. Whereas if it's like that, it's bit, you know, it barely moves, it's barely noticeable. And you can put the decay up as well. So it gives it a massive delay. See, I don't know why anybody would do that, but, you know. So, I mean, stylistically, that's, you know, if you think of producers like uh, Flying Lotus and that whole sort of LA beat sound and also like early sort of like filter house um like you'll hear the whole track sort of being sucked in by the kick drum and you know as well as a technique for mixing that's also you know something that you can use expressively um which is sort of how i've used it in this track because i wanted to make a big point of you know the kick sort of dragging everything down with it <laughs> So as you can see on, on, on this one, um, 
it's not dragging it down as much. And on here, it's dragging it down a lot, and the K is on a lot. Um, and that's for the hi-hats, which... Uh, show here. Turn everything back on again. So the hi-hats, they're not really... Uh, they don't stand out a lot in the track. They only come up sort of at the end of every sort of four or five bars. And that's because of the, the uh, side chain going on. sort of hear them flick up at the end and uh again you know that lends itself to sort of rhythmic structure and it you know it gives it a bit of delay and it gives it its own groove so you know you can get really creative with side chaining it doesn't have to be this you know complicated intricate mixing tool it can it can be fun <laughs> um yeah so that's the kick and the way side chaining works and to get down to the sort of the baseline itself uh, where are we pattern one two there we go pattern four um so <laughs> So you know it's not a, it's not particularly complicated at all really. Um, yeah, I think I just jammed this out on my MIDI controller while the beat was playing. Um, and what I did is again, this is unique to Fruity Loops, I believe. I mean, there are ways to do it in other software, but not as simple as this. Um, so the way that it sort of slides up and down. Um, the way you do that in Fruity Loops is like you select, you paint in a note and you double click it and you click this. So you see it says slide, accept. So that'll slide up to that note now. Um, and that's something that you hear a lot in UK Drill. And I know like probably most UK Drill producers are using Fruity Loops. Um, and I imagine they're doing a fairly similar thing. Um, you can do this with any sample or sound that you put into Fruity Loops, which is just another incredible thing, you know, just being able to warp sound like that. It's, it's insane. Um, but yeah, so I, I suppose it's sort of like a homage to UK drill, this bass line. Um, and Again, it's very simple, it's core. Uh, this is just a stock Fruity Loops plugin, three oscillator. Um, does exactly what it says, it's just three oscillators. And you know, you can have square waves if you want. It's probably gonna sound really harsh. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost, like shockingly primitive um yeah very simple you can import your own waves um but that's not what this thing is about you know it's if you're going to do stuff like that you might as well be using a wavetable or an fm synthesizer like fma or massive or serum um you know freeosk it just does things simply um you know there are so many people i can think of off the top of my head who have used this and only this who have made the absolutely incredible bass lines uh i've got a shout out epoch he's definitely one of them um he uses this thing like an absolute monster i don't know what he does with it but you know it sounds incredible and the, what, what I've done here 
it's just a sine wave, two sine waves, and I've detuned them from each other. So if I was to put them back to normal, sound like that, which is a bit boring. So I just wanted to give it a bit of movement. Um, and I've edited the, the sound envelope here. Uh, what I've done is I've given it a little bit of release. So that means when the note stops playing, um, it will continue and then sort of pit, like drop out of volume itself. Like if I took that off, you see it just, yeah, it doesn't have as much character. So you want to leave it trailing off a little bit. Um, and yeah, you can, again, this is something you can get really creative with. Uh, and it's got a pitch envelope as well. So show you how this works. So yeah, you can get really crazy with that as well. Um, but I haven't really touched that in this. So that's the synthesis of the bass line, if you even want to call it that. It's, you know, it doesn't even deserve to be called synthesis. It's really simple. So now the the effects are where that bass really comes alive. Um, if I turn them all off. You know, while that doesn't sound necessarily bad, it's not great either. Um, and also, 3 osc does this, I don't know why, but it leaves a really little high ringing tone in the bass if you don't EQ it. Like, if you can hear that, I don't know if you're listening on headphones or good speakers. Um, so yeah, I, I had to go to work on that. Um, so what I added first was this great plugin, which again is really simple. Uh, yeah, it was free when I got it. I don't think it's free anymore. Um, but either way, I think it's only 90 quid or something like that, which is really, uh, it's quite a lot of money, but it's really good for something this sort of simple and effective. So it sort of works a bit like a, almost like a guitar pedal board. Um, and it has all these like individual features here. Uh, I haven't used any of them apart from this one, which is its noise. Uh, it's got different types of noise. You know, they've all got their individual character. But I really like the vinyl one because um, it's quite soft. Um, it's not as harsh as the other ones. Uh, and what's really good as well is it you can basically do an internal side chain on it. So if you listen to the bass line, when it actually hits, there's a bit of delay before, a tiny bit of delay and a sort of a bit of a curve before this sound comes in, the sort of vinyl sound. Uh, and you do that with just with simply this little duck thing here. So it just means that the sound of the vinyl, uh, it moves with the sound uh, of the three osc. So that's really handy and really easy. Um, but it has, this plugin has all these other great features. It's distortion's really good. It's reverb here, the space reverb is really good. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend this for people who just want simple and effective like coloration or saturation um and then i did my famously bad eqing yeah uh, yeah i'm not sure <laughs> not sure what i was thinking here this one looks a little bit more involved um so what i've done is i mean what i do with a lot of my bass lines is i don't completely cut the low end which again might be questionable when it comes down to mastering. 
because really what you want with a finished track before you send it to get mastered is you know the frequencies that don't need to be there and won't be heard are just completely cut off um but i quite like having i quite like knowing that there are frequencies that people can't hear because i mean i, I studied this at university quite extensively about infrasonics and stuff and you know how in the past people have put sounds that aren't audible but have a a physical effect they they put that in sounds and they use it for things like as broad as as therapy or for use as actually a weapon to like scare people which is absolutely insane but it's a thing um and you know very famously there's a film called irreversible and for the first half hour of that film there's just a continuous tone that's about 25 hertz i think and while you wouldn't hear that on a television or you know through even fairly decent speakers if you're watching that film in a cinema or with a subwoofer there will just be this sort of sound that you can't hear that you can feel and it i mean the proposal for it to be in the film was to make the watcher feel uncomfortable and i just think that's really cool um so yeah that's why part of the reason i never completely cut out bass but i pushed up the sort of lows and the low mids completely cut out the middle because it's just completely not necessary well i say completely cut out but mostly cut out um and i've pushed up this little high bit here uh, just so that you can sort of emphasize this this plugin that I've used here and I've used a cut here so it gets rid of that little beep but I've pointed out that's just part of 3 osc for some reason but yeah pro q2 is just one of the best eqs ever for being sort of clinical with with your eqing because it lets you create infinite you know spots instead of you know most eqs they're limited to sort of you know an eight channel parametric or a 16 channel parametric so you've only got those that you can sort of move and deal with which is fine but you know i want to make my own uh and then i've put a driver on it uh, this is a basic native instruments plugin. Um, I think it came with my uh, native instruments machine. And yeah, it is what it says it is. It's basically like a distortion plugin. Uh, I haven't used it very harshly here. And I've only got it, you know, affecting. The high end of the frequencies so it's basically just distorting the uh the color plug in a bit further because yeah you can get really wild with it yeah it's one of those things you know like why why would anybody want to do that but you know there's producers out there like mersbo and Ru russell haswell who seem to like that thing uh but anyway, so yeah, I haven't really used it incredibly. I haven't made use of what it can do. It's again, it's a, like, a lot like 3 OSC, the bass plugin. You know, it's just got what it has here. There's no hidden menus or anything. And, you know, it just affects stuff in the way you would expect it to. Um, and then what I did finally was add a fab filter Saturn. Um, and I. I use this a lot in a lot of things um, and what it does is it it just saturates things um, you know it's it's an emulation of an amp saturator so you can go really heavy with it and almost use it as a, a full-on distortion plugin or you can use it a bit more sort of clean in a way uh, 
and just use it to create warmth and I mean the main reason I use it on sub bass in particular is to give the low mids a bit of a, a push uh, because you know a lot of people aren't going to have good speakers or you know even good headphones necessarily but you know if you give the impression that the bass is there the brain can do strange things and you know sort of almost trick your yourself into thinking that there's a very prominent bass line um so yeah i suppose that's more of a mixing technique than something to be used creatively as much as you can use it creatively the reason i've used it here is for the sort of mixing technique um and yeah all i've done i've, I've given it a bit of a push not too much uh and i've pushed sort of the lows low mids and a bit of the high mids and I mean, when I turn it on, it's probably not going to be that audible to when it was off. Yeah, I mean, it all depends on what people are listening to this on. Um, but it, it does give the baseline character and makes it stand out. So those are the basic elements of the track. Uh, it's all surrounding the drums and the bass. Um, all I've done with, so I've got the sample. So this sample is from, um, let me see if I can find it. I probably won't be able to. Um, yeah typical uh it's from a it's from vinyl um so i sample a lot from vinyl i know that's almost a cliche these days but i, I just love vinyl um and yeah it's it's from a an italian library record uh by piero emiliani who's great um if if you know you're not familiar with italian library music or library music as a whole, or Italian music as a whole, uh, I think Piero Emiliani is a good place to start. He's probably the most prolific, or one of the most prolific um, Italian library producers and film soundtrack producers, along with like Alessandro Alessadroni um, and the others. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I sampled that off vinyl. Um, and sorry, I like, I'm budget. I don't have a proper camera. I'm just using my Mac camera. Uh, you can't really see this, but I've got an Emu 6400 here, which is an old sampler from, I think the E6400 Ultra is from 95 or 96. Um, and what makes it really unique is it's got these Z-plane filters on it. Uh, I'm not going to get into that like you know, nerdy stuff this was supposed to be about the simple stuff um, but yeah uh, it's a 12 bit sampler so it has its own character um, and you know it's, it was famously used by Fotec and Source Direct who are the best so what I did was I sampled it from vinyl through my mixer which is a Mackie um, and into my EMU 6400 onto this floppy disk uh, and from there I, I, I think I used the it's got like an internal EQ sort well it's more like a multi-band compressor uh, and I would have used that on the sound to sort of bring out more of its character um, and then that would have gone out again into this, which is an SP404. Um, again, like, I'm not somebody who lusts after hardware particularly. Um, if I get a piece of hardware, there is 100% a reason behind it. And also a reason that can't be, you know, I couldn't replicate it on software. Um, 
And the reason I got this really is because one, I love people like Mad Lib and Raz G and Sam I Am and you know Jay Diller using SP three oh three to make donuts and this is like the upgrade. Um and it's just really easy to use. It's you know, it's no fuss. Everything just you know, you just sample straight into one of its ports here. You know, I've been sampling like off of my phone, off of my TV, and obviously off of the sampler itself. Um, but yeah, if anybody's like wants to get into more hands on sampling and you know, you can't afford an MPC or an SP1200 or whatever, this is really great because it's, it's pretty cheap for what it is. I think it was about 400 quid. Um, but for all the things it can do, you you know, you get every bang for your buck. Uh, and yeah, so this would have gone out again, back into the computer. Um, and I think also on that, I used its vinyl uh, emulation. Because what makes the SP404 great is it's got these inbuilt effects that are really unique. And, you know, I, I make use of those as much as I can as well. Um, so, yeah, long story short, we uh, we ended up with this sample. I did was I just cut the end off and just continuously looped it so it's almost like these suspended strings going throughout and then I chopped other bits out and as you can hear I put delay on them and the delay I used uh, so on one of them, I've used Timeless, which is part of the Fab Filter pack. Um, I haven't really changed a lot on that. And on this one, I have used Portal, which I honestly cannot recommend enough. Um, all of these plugins, actually, uh, by output. Portal, um, oh, what's the other one's called? Uh, Movement, um, and they do a really good distortion plugin as well. Uh, Thermal, um, just absolutely incredible plugins, uh, and really sort of visual, and you know you can get really in on them as well, as you can see here. Uh, yeah, it's, it, you know it can get as complicated as you want. Um, but the way I usually work with these plugins is I'll find a preset that I like and I'll work backwards, like I said earlier, you know, like reverse engineer it uh, and then put it back together again, but, you know, take certain bits out and move bits around. So that's how I've ended up with this reverb sound. Sorry, well, it's, it's more like it's like a delay and a reverb. So yeah, again, really, really simple and to the point. Uh, and then of course, the final sort of bit to that is this sample from uh, American Psycho. How could I forget that? Uh, and what I've done is, um, so the American Psycho sample is linked on here. Uh, and it's got Replica XT on it, which is uh, just a really great and simple to use delay plugin. 
Um, yeah, I haven't really done anything crazy with it. I've just turned up the amount and the size and it's a ping pong delay. So uh, you can just sort of mess with the movement of where it goes on the stereo field. Um, again, that's something that I think came free when I got a machine. Um, if anybody doesn't know what a machine is, uh, it's this. Um, it's basically like a NPC, but um, digital. Um, so yeah, uh, pretty simple again. Just a little bit of EQ. Just cut off all the really harsh highs and the lows, and I've put a timeless on it. But what I've done is timeless is linked to this uh, automation clip. So uh, as you can see here, it just it act basically activates it there. So it'll just there's no timeless on it, but when it gets to there, it will start delaying. So again, it's just a simple thing, but I think like a lot of people gloss over the sim the simple things. And forget that, you know, somebody who's never, ever produced before might be like, wait, but what? Like, I, I have no idea. Like, what is that? So, yeah, I just wanted to make everything as crystal clear as I could for anybody of any level producing. Um, and yeah, that is the tune. Like, literally, that is it. Um, And I added those hi-hats in. Uh, <laughs> uh. But yeah, I added those just on this, uh, on the step sequencer. And a great thing about the step sequencer is you can do this. Click this little button here. And if you go note pitch, I can have it going down in pitch like that. So another really simple process that is unique to Fruity Loops. Sort of, a, I suppose it's like emulating a, a, the interface of a Roland 808. Um, but yeah, I don't really use the step sequencer a lot anymore. Um, I used to when I first started using Fruity Loops, like I imagine a lot of people did when they first started using Fruity Loops. It's just so simple. It's just everything's there and you just, you know, colour stuff in like that, you know. Um, it's the foundation of a lot of old grime tunes and stuff like that. But yeah, so that comes in. And obviously you can't actually hear it that much because it's being triggered to go down by the side chain. So when you've got all of that and you put everything together, you've got a tune. <laughs> um, I keep saying, you know, it's that simple, but obviously the complicated part is really writing the track and, you know, knowing your influences and, oh my God, there's a spider on my desk. That can't go down. <sighs> they say it's bad luck to kill spiders but i'm sorry they're just gross uh <laughs> anyway um so yeah i mean as you can see as well like i haven't used a cumbersome amount of tracks on the actual sort of arrangement layout uh window and yeah, so 16, including the automation clip. Um, yeah, I tend not to use like a huge amount of tracks because it's kind of like, why would you in Fruity Loops? Well, I can see why people use a lot of tracks in like Logic or Ableton and stuff like that because you have to put sort of, well, theoretically, you have to put each individual sound to a track. Uh, I mean, if you want to really get down to sort of sequencing stuff like cleverly, 
Whereas obviously with Fruity Loops, it works in patterns and everything's sort of self-contained in the pattern. So there's not a whole lot of need to create loads of tracks. You know, it's only as complicated as you want it to be. Um, I mean, yeah, like if I were using Logic, you know, track one would be a kick, track two probably be another kick, and track three would either be another kick or a snare. And, you know, depending on how much you layer stuff, you could end up with over 100 tracks fairly quickly. Whereas, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to have everything self-contained in its own layer. And then, you know, you can link each individual sound to a mixing track. Um, and, you know, it also helps you bounce out stems because, you know, if I just go like that. So that's all the drums oh, and the hi-hats, I suppose. <coughs> so that's just the drum track. And then I can go file export and that's, you know bounced out as the drums as a stem so yeah it's all fairly simple uh and what you can do uh so they took a note out of ableton's book um is you can process a whole track as an audio file uh so you don't you do, uh, consolidate this track from track start and what that'll do is it'll just bounce the the whole of this track to an audio file and it'll still have all of the effects and processing you've done on it so it's a lot like the freeze track feature in Ableton which is really handy if you're trying to save processing power if you've got you know loads of synths and loads of effects being used uh, you can delete them all and just bounce it to an audio file which is really handy uh, but obviously for this like it doesn't really matter because I'm not using a whole lot of processing power. It's all coming from samples anyway, really. Um, I mean, as you can see here, this tells you how your CPU is doing. Mine's bubbling at about 40 to 50 percent usage, which is actually suspiciously high. <laughs> but I think my Mac is on its last legs. So whatever. Um, but yeah, this is the track. Um, So yeah, that's um, that's the track, uh, and I mean, it would be difficult to go into detail on anything else, like you know, why I've gone for each volume I have on the mixer. But you know, it's all personal preference, really. And I think maybe if I did this again, I would go a bit more detailed on some of the bits but that was the whole point of showing this tune was that you know I went into this tune in a in a bad mood I was like you know frustrated and pissed off and depressed and I just wanted to like alleviate myself in you know this is the best way I know how to do that um and I just made a really dark horrible tune um and yeah so i'll show you what i've got on the master um i always try to unless it's a pre-master so if you know 
the tune needs to be sent to a mastering engineer to be mastered for vinyl or whatever. It's always good to leave sort of three to six dB headroom because um, then, you know, they're able to push it through better equipment. Um, and obviously they're trained and experts in that field, so they know what's up. Um, and, you know, I, I was taught a lot of this stuff by Bo, who masters pretty much all of my records. Um, you know, I've sat down with him in his studio a lot of times and he's talked me through stuff. Um, but, you know, he always said to me, make sure your loudest parts are the loudest and your quietest parts are the quietest, which sounds obvious, but it's not. Because, you know, I think a lot of mistakes people make is they try to make everything as loud as possible. And that's fully not what it's about. Even when, you know, when I'm like, like I'm going to show you now, I've done my own master just so I can, you know, if I want to play the tune out uh, or, you know, I'm sending it out to people. Oh, my God, there's a moth. What is this room? Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so, yeah, the whole point of doing the master for myself is, like I said, so I can play it out if I want to. Or if, you know, somebody wants to play it on the radio, I can send them my own master. And what I tend to do for my own masters is I make it peak around or before zero decibels. So I try to flatten out the top. So it's basically compression, um, but what I do, so this is me, just me specifically, like you can do it however you want. I make sure that the low end is completely in mono. That's sort of a habit that I've got from DJing. Um, like I have this horror story, like a DJ horror story where I spent hours and hours making this tune. And I got really clever with it, you know. I had like eight different drum breaks running and they were all going like bouncing left and right and like going over your head. Like if you listen on the headphones, it sounds great. Um, the tune's actually, it's so it's out now on Sneaker Social Club. It's called Lost in the Asylum. It's on the, um, the EP that I recently put out on the label. And I remember I was, I was, uh, I was DJing in Berlin and I was like, oh, perfect, I can debut the track there and uh i started the track uh as my intro tune um and i was like oh my god it's silent what's happening <laughs> and it was because clubs believe it or not most of them or the ones that i know at least still operate on a mono sound system so all of that information that's on like the far left or the far right of the stereo field is gone so it was like the intro is like a minute long and the track was just playing and occasionally where the like pan would move over you would catch a little bit of a drum <laughs> and it was just like <laughs> and i was just like oh my god um so from then on i made a point of you know my tracks still have a lot of stereo information in them because I always try to produce for headphone listening more than a club. But I also make sure that, you know, there is something that's like anchoring it down uh, in the mono. So as, you know, things like that don't happen. Um, and I, like a really good example is Dillinger. Again, I've already said about Dillinger already um the way his tunes work is if you listen to all of them the intros have really big stereo scope they're not like entirely in left and right but you know they're very broad but as soon as his tunes drop that it switches to mono so everything just hits you bang on the head um so yeah, this is just a habit that I've got into of just making sure that the low end is completely in mono because if it does get pressed to vinyl as well, um, if you've got stereo information in the bass, 
you're potentially at risk of, of blowing up the cutting head, which isn't good. Uh, whoever's cutting your vinyl will be very angry about that. Um, and again, I've sort of narrowed it down a little bit uh, on the low mid. And then here, I put it basically both like going towards maximum so that the high mids and high end are sort of shimmering on left and right. Um, and then the rest of this is fairly mundane, simple stuff. Uh, that I didn't even use, so I don't know why that's even on. And the maximizer, again, this is something that you wouldn't want to use unless you're making your own master. And again, it's just like an EQ, uh, a compressor. So it just makes sure it doesn't go over this point. And you can see the effect it's having there. It just dips down on these little spikes that are like sort of trying to push out of this little area that you've specified. Uh, and then I just, again, I don't know really why I did that. Uh, just put a tiny little peak boost there in an EQ. Um, and yeah, you can see. Yeah, so it's peaking at like 0 0.2, sorry, minus 0 0.2, minus 0 0.1, which is, you know, where I want it to be. Um, yeah, and that is the tune. Uh, and I hope that was helpful. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken at length at, about really simple things, which for me, like, I'm just thinking back to when I was like 13 years old and there weren't resources like this on the internet and how frustrating it used to be going into like the dogs on acid forums and there would just be like all these old men like, yeah, yeah, no, you, you need to get a, you need to get an Akai S950, uh, no, you need to use Logic. Oh, you need to get a mixing desk, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, no, you don't. You don't need to do any of that. And that's not even what people are doing anymore. So can you just shut up and tell me what to do? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it's good to sort of focus on uh, the simple things sometimes. Um, and, you know, maybe one day I'll do a more complicated uh, sort of track breakdown of a more complicated tune um but you know this is what it is and it's exactly what i wanted it to be which is just a loud cumbersome angry track with not a lot going on um and obviously the big influences behind this track uh were like early dubstep tunes by like digital mystics and loafer and d1 screen people like that um, but also with the beat, uh, that was sort of the influence of hip hop, particularly like, like I said, the LA beat scene, like Jay Dilla, Mad Lib, Flying Lotus, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it's at one of my favorite tempos. I don't know why this has become one of my favorite tempos, 118 BPM, like so much works at that tempo. It's... I don't know, I have, the, I have a few like key tempo ranges that I work in that I don't really go outside of, and 118 is one of them. Things just feel like they flow nice at that BPM. Um, but yeah, so that's the track, that's the breakdown. Um, thank you for Rendermag for asking me to do this. Um, so along with this, uh, I'm going to give out the track for free, and also I'm going to give the project file. Uh, the Fruity Loops zipped project file out for free. Um, so the way that I'll work is it'll be what you see. It'll have all of the samples and all of the arrangement in it. The only thing that probably won't load unless you have the plugins is the plugins that I used. So yeah, that means that potentially people can mess about with this and get a bit more creative with it. Uh, if I don't have the plugins that I've used to create it how it is. Um, but yeah, 
thank you and i hope that will help people